Hello everyone and welcome back. In this video, we're going to talk about center of mass. It's actually something that you've already been, kind of been using, but we never really stopped to give it a name. And we definitely need to go into a little bit more detail. So let's start by defining what is the center of mass. So the center of mass of an object or a system of objects is the point that acts as if all of the object's mass was concentrated at that point. So as an example, let's say that you had to draw a free body diagram of a five kilogram crate sitting on the table. So you would probably draw that crate as a rectangle and then turn that rectangle into a point or a dot. And then you'd put that dot in the geometric center of the rectangle. That dot is the center of mass. You have reduced that entire crate to that dot. And then on that point, you would start to label your force vectors like FW, the weight vector, or FG, the gravitational force, or the normal force, FN, maybe some friction, maybe an applied force, but you're doing everything on that dot. And that point is the center of mass. And what we're talking about today is how do you know where to put that dot? For this example, it was easy. What about another example? Here we have a, a child in a wagon and someone's pulling the wagon at an angle. How would we have done this in the past? We probably took that wagon, drew it as a rectangle, turned the rectangle into a dot, and then put that dot right smack in the middle. But technically, that dot shouldn't go in the middle because that implies a perfectly symmetrical object. And this girl is sitting in the wagon, which means there's more mass towards the back end of the wagon than there is to the front end of the wagon. And we're going to learn how to shift that dot so that you put that center of mass point at the correct location. All right, but before we get into that, I also wanna point out something that can be a little confusing. Um, we have center of mass, and we also have another term called center of gravity. Technically, these two words are not the same and they mean something different, but center of mass and center of gravity are equal to each other in a location with a uniform gravitational field. So let me explain what that means. So let's look at a picture of the earth here. And I wanted to draw what are called the gravitational field lines. I wanna draw like the, the lines of gravity all coming towards the center of the earth. So these lines of gravity are called field lines. And when the field lines are farther apart, that means gravity is less. And when the field lines are closer together, that means gravity's stronger. Well, that makes sense. Near the surface of the Earth, gravity's 9.8. And as I go out into space, I know that gravity becomes less. So if I'm looking at a perspective that's like the Earth and out in space, then center of mass and center of gravity are two different things. But if I was near the surface of the earth, like this, like you and I spend all of our time on the surface of the earth, moving around near the surface of the earth, near the surface of the earth, we can assume that gravity, it's about 9.8 and it's constant. So in our everyday world with the things that we experience, for the most part, center of mass and center of gravity are equal to each other. Therefore, we can use those two terms interchangeably. And I only point that out because this lesson is about center of mass. It's not about calculating problems involving center of gravity, but you will find those terms used interchangeably and just know that that's appropriate for what we're doing. All right, let's keep going. So how do you know where to put that dot? How do you know where the center of mass is? Well, if the object is symmetrical or perfectly uniform, it's at the geometric center. So if I have a crate right smack in the middle, 
If I have a baseball, right smack in the middle. If I have a pier or a triangle, right smack in the middle. But if I have something that's not symmetrical, then I either have to calculate the location of the center of mass, or I can sometimes experimentally determine it even faster. So for example, a baseball bat, where's the center of mass? The United States, where would the center of mass be? What about a birthday cake? So let's look at experimentally determining the center of mass. Like what could I do with this baseball bat to find the center of mass? So the first thing that you can do is you can balance the object on your finger or on a support. And the point where it balances is the center of mass. So if I pick up a broom and it balances on my finger right there, that's where I would put the dot. The FW of the broom would go right there. If I had like a piece of cardboard or a piece of plywood and it balances on a support right here, then that location is the center of mass. So all I got to do is pick up that baseball bat and figure out where it balances on my finger. And then I know where the center of mass is. You can try that right now with your pencil or pen. All right, the second thing that you can do is you can toss the object like a projectile. So you have like projectile motion parabola going through the air. And the object will rotate about its center of mass. And that dot will be the point, that center of mass point will be the point that maps out the parabola. So for example, I take a wrench and the center of mass happens to be right there. I toss it like a projectile. And as it rotates, that red dot defines the parabolic motion of the wrench. So that's easy to do, but I realize it's kind of hard to see from the ground when you're trying that. All right, so what else can you do? This is kind of contrived, but it's kind of a fun one. So it says that the center of mass is the intersection of two plumb lines. All right, so what does that mean? So I do this activity in my classroom where we cut out a map of the United States minus Hawaii and Alaska. And you can pick any spot that you want and you poke, oh, by the way, the map is like on poster board, something rigid, thick and rigid. So you poke a hole someplace and I picked Maine. And so this is a thumbtack. And so now I'm only holding the tip of the thumbtack, the top of the thumbtack. So my map is able to kind of like swing freely like a pendulum on the thumbtack. So my map is free to move. And so it's kind of like naturally hanging like this. And then I take a, a string, but I want the string to stay kind of taut. So I tie a little washer at the bottom of the spring or the string. And then I take my pencil and I just sketch along this line. All right, so that's one of my plumb lines. Now I just have to repeat it with a different spot. So I have that drawn on there and now I'm just gonna take the map and I'm gonna put a thumbtack into some place in the state of Washington. So up here, I put my thumbtack in, I hang my string, I put the washer on and I'm gonna sketch this line with my pencil. And where these two lines intersect, that is the center of mass. So there's a little town in the United States, in Kansas, Lebanon, Kansas. They called themselves the geographic center or the center of mass of the United States. That's their claim to fame. They know they won that, that prize. And it doesn't matter what locations that you pick. Uh, you could have picked Texas. You could have picked Florida. You could have picked something even in the middle. It will always turn out to be the same. So that's something that you can do experimentally to find the center of mass of something. All right, the next thing I just wanna point out is stability and the center of mass. 
It says an object is stable if its center of mass or center of gravity is above its base of support. So here is the center of gravity, center of mass of the Leaning Tower of Pisa. And if I hung a string straight down, here's its base of support. And as long as my plumb line is between my base of support, it's stable. So the Leaning Tower of Pisa is not going to fall down it because it meets the concept of stability. So this is like a double decker bus, let's say from London. And the center of gravity, center of mass is right here. And if I drop my plumb line, it is within the base of support. It's within the base of the wheels. So my double decker bus can tilt this much and I know from a physics standpoint it's not going to tip over. But if my bus tipped this much and my plumb line now is outside the base of the wheels, then my bus will tip over. So it's important to know where the center of gravity or the center of mass of something is um, in terms of equilibrium if you're building a tall building or construction or something like that. All right. What about a person? Where is your center of mass or your center of gravity? So when you think about a baby who's not yet born like a fetus, it is connected to the mom by the umbilical cord, which means that the fetus rotates about the umbilical cord, which means that your belly button is your natural center of mass or center of gravity. That's your natural instinctive one. But as your body grows and changes shape, um, it can obviously differ. And so you can also take your natural center of mass at your belly button. And if you let's say even extend your arms, then you can change the location of your center of mass. So times that you feel unstable, like let's say a pregnant woman now is very pregnant and this big belly baby sticking out, that changes the, the location of their center of mass, which may be outside of their feet and they don't feel stable anymore. So they end up kind of arcing their back backwards or doing something to kind of instinctively get their center of mass back over their base of support. So that's just something that you can think about in real life and application. On your notes, I have a couple of uh, links. One is a TikTok video and the second one is a YouTube video, which are just some little games about what in general women can do and men sometimes cannot do just because we have different body shapes and we have different locations of our center of mass. I won't run those videos now, but you can look at them on your own. All right, the last thing I want to look at here is predicting the location of the center of mass. So I'm just gonna make up a couple of examples. So let's say that we had a rod that was five kilograms and we had this big heavy sphere, like a bowling ball at the other end. And you had to predict the location of the center of mass. So I'm just gonna look at, you know, 20 kilograms. This is pretty heavy, pretty heavy. And this is pretty long. And uh, so I'm just going to put my mouse like, I don't know, like maybe like someplace right in here, I think is where the center of gravity would be. But what if I reverse it, that this rod is really heavy. And then I have this five kilogram ball at the end. Where do I think the center of mass would be? Well, because this is so heavy and so long, you know, I don't know, maybe like someplace over here. So here I predicted it like over further to the right and then I predicted it over here to the left. And my point is instinctively the mass matters and so does the location or the length of something. And so both mass and location matter. And so we can take that concept now and put it together to come up with an equation 
that we can use to calculate the center of mass of something. And that equation is this. So this is XCM. That stands for the location of the center of mass on the x-axis. It's equal to the first mass and its location on the x-axis plus the second mass and its location on the x-axis divided by the total mass. If I had three masses, I would just add on a plus location of, or the mass of the third particle and its location on the x-axis. And then I would just have to add the third mass on the bottom. So quite simply, it's each mass times its location plus each mass times its location, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, divided by the total mass of all of the pieces. And if something has um, is two-dimensional and it has like a y-axis on it, then I can do a YCM and I can do the same concept. And if you're looking at something that's three-dimensional, you could add a Z cm onto it and do the same thing. We're going to limit our examples to the x-axis or maybe two-dimensional objects. So let's look at some problems that can help us see the different ways we can approach center of mass from a calculation standpoint. So I'm going to solve these problems on the sheet of paper so that I have a little bit more space. So, okay, the first problem says that we have, uh, so they, they put this, I'll call it measuring tape here that's here to help us, but that we have a one kilogram mass, so one kilogram mass down here at position zero. And then down here, so if I look at the picture, I can go like 10, 20, 30, 40, 50, 60, 70. I can see at 80, at 80, I have a three kilogram mass. So I'll call that position 80. And at position 90, I have a two kilogram mass. So all of these masses are in a straight line. So I'm just going to call this the x-axis. And so where would be the location of the center of mass if I had to collectively look at them as a group and turn that group into one dot? Where would I put that point? So I can use the equation like this. So the location of the center of mass on the x-axis is going to be equal to, and then I always just kind of like start at position zero and I start walking along the x-axis. So as I walk along the x-axis, I encounter a mass, a mass of one kilogram x, where is its location? It's at the zero point. And I'm going to keep on walking. So I keep on walking and then I encounter another mass, three kilograms. And it's at the 80 centimeter location. So I'm going to turn that into meters. And then I keep on walking and then I encounter a two kilogram mass and it is at position 90 centimeters or 0.9. And so I have three masses. So I have to add them up, all three. And that's how you use the equation. So let's do our math very quickly. So the one times zero is gonna fall out. Three times point, this is gonna, point eight would be 2.4 plus, this would be 1.8 divided by five, six. And that turns out to be 0.7 meters or 70 centimeters, 70 centimeters. So if I collectively had to turn this whole system into a dot, I would put it right here. Here's a dot at 70 centimeters. All right, there's another part of this question that says, what if that 
x-axis was like a meter stick and it has mass itself. So I'm now going to take that and kind of make it look like a meter stick. So those masses are still there, but now I got this meter stick. So now I really have four objects. So this mass would have a dot in the middle. This mass would have a dot at 80. This mass would have a dot at 90. But what about the meter stick? A meter stick is a symmetrical object. And so its dot would be in the middle of it, which would be like, like here at 50. So I'm going to take the meter stick and I'm going to turn it into a dot at 50. And what was the mass of the meter stick? I think the mass was two kilograms. And I'm going to repeat this problem. So the location of the center of mass taking the meter stick into account. Again, I'm going to walk along the x-axis. And so I get to my starting spot and I encounter a one kilogram mass at position zero. And then I keep on walking and I hit a dot that stands for the meter stick two. And this time I'm just going to leave it in centimeters. Just know our answer is going to be in centimeters. So this would be at 50. And then I encounter the next mass at three. It's still at 80. And the last mass is two at 90. And now my total mass is going to be five, six, seven, eight. It's going to be over eight. All right, so one times zero, so two times 50. So I have 100 plus 240 plus 180 over eight. And I get 65 centimeters. So the center of mass, when you take the meter stick into account, shifted the system back a little bit to the position of 65. So that's what we're trying to do, is to figure out when we have a collection of real life objects, where do we put the dot to do our free body diagrams? All right, let's look at the next example. Number two. So number two is a picture of a pendulum. So I'm going to kind of draw my picture a little bit bigger here on my paper. So in terms of a pendulum, it's like made up of this rod. And a sphere or a disc on the end. All right, so I have, here I had one, two, three, plus the meter stick, four objects. Here, I only have two objects. I have a meter stick and the sphere. And I can see that they are in a straight line. Let me grab my ruler here. And since they're in a straight line, I'm just going to go like this. Now I'm going to pretend that this is my x-axis. So I'm just going to tilt my paper a little bit so it looks like an x-axis. And I'm going to talk to myself. So here's the, the rod. So that rod has a mass of two. And a rod is a symmetrical object, which means its center of mass would go right in the middle. So I'm just going to turn it into a dot. And since this rod has a length of 0.5 meters, I think it was meters. Um, let me check. I'm gonna move this. Hold on one sec. It is sent to, oh yeah, 0.5 meters. Okay, so this location of this dot then would be at 0.5. 0.25 meters. All right, and then the sphere is symmetrical, so its center of mass would be right there. And the mass of this is four. And it said that the radius was 0 
six centimeters. So I'm going to call this the radius right there, the radius. That's 0 0.06. All right, so I'm going to do the same thing. I'm going to walk along my x-axis. And so I'm trying to find the location of xcm. So I'm going to start here at zero, and I'm going to keep walking until I hit a mass right there. That dot stands for the mass of the rod. So there's the mass. Where is its location from zero? It's 0 0.25, 0 0.25. Plus, I'm going to keep on walking, keep on walking until I hit another mass. This mass stands for the sphere. What is its location? It's not 0 0.06, it's from zero. It's like on my number line. So this whole length was 0.5 plus 0 0.06, that'd be 0.56 divided by the total mass, four plus two, that's gonna give me a mass of six. And when I number crunch that, XCM turns out to be 0.5. Four six meters. Let's see if that makes sense. So here's 0. 0.5. So 0. 0.46 would be about right there. 0. 0.46. That's where I would put the dot for this collection of objects. So even if you have something real life-ish, like a pendulum, just know that it you can make it like an x-axis and take each individual uniform object and turn those into dots. Okay, the next example, the next example, we're getting a little bit more complex here, is a collection of three objects. All right, I got a lot of moving parts here. Okay, so I have three individual objects and they are kind of arranged in an XY grid in a two dimensional space. So object one, it says has a mass of 3.1, object two has a mass of four, and object three has a mass of 9.3, 9.3. And so they kind of form like a triangle shape, but it's not a perfect triangle. And the masses differ, so I'm not quite sure where the center of mass would be. So in this case, I need to do two separate equations. I need to find the x-coordinate of the center of mass and then the y-coordinate of the center of mass and then I'll know where the center of mass is. So let's do them separately. So here's the x coordinate of the center of mass. So what I mean by that is we're gonna walk along this x axis and apply the equation. So we're gonna pause every time we hit a mass. Okay, so here I am at zero. Oh, there's a mass right there. So I'm gonna write it down. There's a mass at position zero. Then I'm gonna keep walking. And there is a mass here at position one. It happens to be a little bit higher, but there is a mass at x equals one. So the mass is three and it's at x equals one. And then I keep on walking. When I get to two, there is a mass at x equals two. It happens to be four and it's at position x equals two. And then I have to add up all of those masses. And when I added up all those masses, I got 16.4. The zero crosses out. And XCM, I got to be 1.05. So 1.05 comma something, the Y. We need to get the Y now. So to get the y coordinate, we're just going to do the same thing, but this time we're going to walk up 
the y axis. And we're going to apply the y center of mass equation. So I have y cm. And again, every time I hit a mass, I'm going to stop. And I hit a mass right there in the beginning. So I hit a 3.1 at y is 0. And then I keep walking up. And it looks like there's nothing at 1, but there is. Because this y value is, or this 4 has a y value of 1 position wise. So this mass of four is at y equals one. And then I keep walking up and this 9.3 is at y position two. And then I divide by the total mass, which is still going to be 16.4. And I find out that ycm is 1.38 centimeters. So I'm going to plug that in here, 1.38. I guess I don't really know the units. And this is the x and the y coordinates of where the center of mass is. Let's test it out and see if it looks possible. So x, 1.05, would be about right there. Up 1.38, like about right there. So if I had this collection of three masses and they were positioned how are they are spaced here and they had those respective masses that would be the location of the center of mass all right so that's how you do a two-dimensional situation all right the last example is i'll say the trickiest because there's a couple things going on here number one is this is an odd shaped object so let's pretend that we took a piece of cardboard and we cut it out like this. So it's kind of an odd shaped piece of something, a piece of steel, piece of cardboard. So it has this weird shape. So I could take that weird shape and I could kind of like break it down into a bunch of boxes because I know how to find the center of mass of a box. And so that's the secret when you have a weird shaped object. See if you can break it down into a bunch of individual shapes. And number two, they don't tell me the mass of this piece. And so we're going to have to deal with that one too. All right, but let's talk to ourselves. So I just broke it down into one, two, three, four, five, six pieces. So I know the center of mass of this piece would be right in the middle, right in the middle, right in the middle, right in the middle middle and middle. So I now have taken this sheet of cardboard and broken it down into one, two, three, four, five, six dots. That's kind of like this. This problem had three dots in it. This one now has six. So I'm going to do the same thing trying to find the center of mass of each of these six dots. All right, this problem is also a little bit more complicated because they tell us that the x and the y axis is divvied up into increments of 16. So this is 16, this is 32, and this is 48. Same thing here, 16, 32, and 48. All right, but what I really care about is where those dots are. So if this dot is in the middle, it means all these dots are on the eight. And these dots, 16 plus eight, are gonna be on the 24 location. And 32 plus eight is gonna be 40. These are gonna be on the 40 location. All right, so let's see what we can do with this. All right, let's walk across the x-axis. So I'm going to make this the x-axis. So as I walk across this x-axis and I get to, I'm starting at zero. It doesn't matter if I'm here or down here. I guess I should do it down here. So when I get to position eight, when I get to position eight, I'm going to encounter three 
pieces, three dots. So I don't know what the mass of them are. Well, whatever the mass is, I have three of them. And they're at position eight. Then I keep walking and I get to 24 and I have two pieces on the X equals 24. So I have two pieces, whatever the mass is on 24. And then I keep walking and I have one piece, one M on 40 divided by the total mass. One, two, three, four, five, six times whatever their mass is. So this would be 24M, 24M plus, this would be 48M plus 40M over 6M and that turned out to be 112 M, 112 M over 6 M. And you can see those M's fall out that we don't really even need to know the mass of them. And so 112 divided by six turns out to be 18.67. So the X coordinate is 18. 0.67 comma and I'm trying to find the y the y coordinate. All right, the y coordinate is going to be So let's move this up for you a little bit. So this time I'm going to walk up the y axis and I walk up and I get to position 8 and I have three pieces at y equals eight. So I have three M's at eight. I keep on walking. And when I get to 24, I have one piece. I have one piece at the 24 position. And then I have two pieces at the 40 position, all divided by... 6m again. All right, so this time I get 24m plus 24m plus 80m all over 6m. And again, those m's are going to cancel. So 128m over 6m, cancel, cancel. And I get 21. 0.33. So 21.33. All right, let me map that out. So 18.67. So here's 16, 17, 18, up 21, 16, 24. Uh, I know maybe like about right there. Look at that. The center of mass is not even part of the shape. Yes, that can happen. The center of mass doesn't have to be on the physical object. Let me show you uh, my last slide here. Hold on one sec. Share screen right here. Okay, so if you had a soccer ball, that soccer ball is hollow, full of air. Its center of mass would be smack in the middle of that air. A boomerang, the center of mass is outside of the boomerang. And if you toss a boomerang and it rotates like the wrench example that we talked about, it's going to rotate about this center of mass or center of gravity point. And finally, you might have seen this toy. This toy is a little plastic bird. He's got little weights in his wings. He's got a weight here and he's got a weight here. And because of the way he's designed, his center of mass happens to be right 
at the tip of his beak. Kind of like the boomerang if we kind of made a little tip going out there, which means that this bird balances on your finger or balances on the edge of the table. And when you look at it, you would not think that he would balance there. You say, oh my God, he's heavy. Like, why isn't he falling? Because we are balanced at our center of mass. So the center of mass does not have to physically be on the object. Okay, I think we talked about enough examples that you should be able to do your homework. I hope that helped.